wanted to start tonight with a quote that I wrote down because I can't remember anything anymore. <laughs> I believe that books, once they are written, have no need of their authors. That quote is from Elena Ferrante. And I'm sure that everybody believes that the reason that she said that is because her identity to some extent is still shrouded in mystery. And saying that a book has no need of its author um, exempts her from unveiling herself. But the truth is, I agree with her completely. When I'm working on a novel, it's like a bird in a cage. I've got the cage door closed. But the moment that I publish it, I've opened the door of the cage and the bird has flown out. And the bird now belongs to you. It no longer matters what my intent was. It no longer matters what I meant when I said X, Y, or Z. All that matters once a book is published is what readers bring to the table. And that's why it's always so gratifying to be at a gathering like this and to see the people who now have the bird. <laughs> Having said that, um, I thought it might be useful for all of you to hear a little bit about what it's like when the cage door is still closed. And it's particularly meaningful for me to talk about that at this moment because I'm at an odd kind of inflection point. As you all know, today was the publication date of the paperback of Miller's Valley. But I have already delivered a new novel called Alternate Side in a first draft version, which means that over the next month or so, my wonderful editor, Kate Medina, assures me that's all it will take. I will be revising um, that book for publication in a year, a year and a half, whenever Random House thinks that the time is right. And because I've already delivered a draft of alternate side, I'm already doing a lot of thinking about the book that I'm going to start on once I finish the revisions to alternate side. Because a lot of what happens when you're beginning a novel happens before you ever type a word. It happens during a six to eight month period where when you're, say, running four miles in Riverside Park, or um, making pot roast, or driving to Wegmans, <laughs> you're thinking. You're thinking about a character, and you're thinking about a character who is growing up in a small town in the middle of nowhere. And you're thinking about what her birth order is, and eventually concluding that she's the youngest of three children, and that she has two older brothers. And you're thinking of what kind of a girl she is as a little girl, and realizing that she's the kind of little girl who's a watcher, who sees things, who understands the world, because she's watching people all the time. And over time, you develop in your mind a fairly clear picture of Mimi Miller. And when that picture becomes clear enough, when she starts to interact with Tommy, or her mother, or LaRonda, you realize that it's time to sit down and start to write. And so that's what I do almost every day. Um, I have a whole series of rituals in which I engage every morning, which are all designed to not write. <laughs> because not writing is my favorite thing in the whole world, except for reading. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I, I do either walk really fast or run every morning. I do read four newspapers every morning. I do have the same boring thing for breakfast every morning. Um, I do talk to my closest friend on the phone virtually every morning unless one of us has a deadline to meet. And then at about 9.30, I run out of things to do, and I go upstairs and I start to write. Um, and some days it goes really, really well, and I sort of effortlessly feel for, no, 
scratch the effortlessly. <laughs> I sort of feel for two or three hours like I'm living on the Miller farm in Miller's Valley. And some days it just feels like I'm pushing the rock uphill and getting nowhere. And every once in a great while, which is why I still do it, um, I sit down and I start to type and I look up and two hours have gone by. And I've been completely transported. And those are the few and far between mornings when the whole deal is worth it. At a certain point, I type a sentence and say to myself, oh my god, that's the last sentence. It always comes as a surprise to me. Boom, we're done. Um, and then before I give it to Kate Medina and my agent, Amanda Urban, I read the entire book aloud to myself because it's in reading aloud that I can hear what's wrong with it. Um, it's in reading aloud that you can hear a run-on sentence. I mean, if, if you're reading a sentence aloud and you can't breathe halfway through, <laughs> then that's God's way of telling you something. If you read a line of dialogue and it doesn't sound like something that anyone ever really said in real life, then you know something about that line of dialogue. It takes me about a week. Um, I feel a little bit nutty while I'm doing it, um, but I, I find a lot of things that need to be fixed during the course of that week. And then I, I give the draft, which is usually taken about a year and a half to two years to produce um, to Kate, and um, she uh, calls me and tells me how much she loves it, how great the characters are, how beautiful the writing is, what a terrific book it is. I do not listen to any of that. <laughs> I don't believe it. It has no meaning to me. I just wait for what I call the enormous envelope, <laughs> um, which is, in fact, an enormous envelope. Kate still likes to edit on paper, and the least said about that, the better. Um, and so she prints out the manuscript. She. Um, uh, edits and annotates on the manuscript, and then she sends me quite a lengthy single-spaced um, memo about what she thinks needs to be done to the book, um, which is incredibly painful to me. As I was saying to Susan earlier tonight while we were sitting back there, I, I read all the time about novelists whom I admire who say, oh, the revising is my favorite part. That's where I think the real work gets done. And I just think we're never going to be friends. <laughs> um, because that just isn't my favorite part. Um, I, I, have, um, I have this fantasy. And my second son, who is a young adult novelist, shares it with me that someday we will hand in a manuscript and our editor will say, it's perfect, don't change it. <laughs> but alternate side is novel number nine, and it hasn't happened yet. It's just that the notes have gotten um, somewhat shorter, in part because I have um, completely drunk the Kate Medina Kool-Aid, and when I'm writing, I can hear her voice in my head saying, that's an awfully long description. It really slows the story down, doesn't it? And, and sometimes I try to ignore that voice, and then I get the envelope back, and she says, that's an awfully long description. <laughs> so I do the revisions. Um, we get to a point, I don't do all the revisions. I probably do about 60 to 70% of what Kate wants, but about 30% of it, I think she's wrong about. And we agree to disagree. Um, and we get the book to where we want it, and um, then uh, I, I, a paid, pull, a paid announcement here. You know how everybody says nobody edits anymore? Not true. The copy editors at Random House are aces, and they have saved me from myself more times than I can count. I wrote a novel in which someone was taking a cab uptown on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> there is an accident. <laughs> I mean, they're just, they're just absolutely splendid. So the copy editors do work their magic, and, um, and then I get something called First Pass Pages. Um, the, the French poet Paul Valéry once said, one does not so much finish a poem as abandon it. 
And that's how I feel about a novel at a certain point. I just can't anymore. And so with the first pass pages, which are the last chance to fix anything up, um, my eldest child, who is, um, well, I won't say he's anal. <laughs> I toilet trained him, so I know that, that there was nothing odd there. But he's very specific, and he's a terrific speller, unlike some people in the United States of America. He's a terrific speller. And he's a crack grammarian, and so he does that last read through. And then they come up, the people here who do such great work come up with eventually a fantastic cover and a plan for marketing and then the novel and then we open the cage and the bird flies. Um, I find it a very difficult process. Um, I'm very intimidated by writing. Um, I Every day I look at it and think, really is this any good at all? Um, and, um, and so, you know, getting the kind of response from readers that I've gotten from them at events like this um, sort of enables me to go back and put butt in chair, as we say, is the first directive for being a writer, and um, and keep on and keep on doing. So um, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you, and, and with that, I think I should open the floor for questions. About the creative process. Are you the kind of person, I have a question about your creative process. Are you the kind of writer that sits down and, and just first draft, first draft, um, just writes from the inside and just lets it flow and go and you have no idea really what's going to happen at the very end? Or are you one of those planners that have outlines and things and it goes along that way following something that you've thought all the way through? Or a combination? Or uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of neither of those. I'm, I'm not a planner and, um, and I do sort of just sit down every day and meander through the streets of my story. Um, but I always know where I'm going to wind up. I always know where I'm starting. In fact, the first chapter is always the easiest for me because I've been walking around thinking about it for six months. So that by the time I finally sit down for that first chapter, it's like transcribing. Hmm. And I always know more or less where I'm going to wind up. The middle is the tough part of any novel as far as I'm concerned. And in fact, it's where a lot of really good novels fall apart, um, that you feel like somehow you've lost the narrative thread. Um, there's, there's a kind of a sag in the middle. But it's also the part where you make all the discoveries. I mean, I remember working on the novel before this one called Still Life with Breadcrumbs, and I was sitting at my desk typing, and, and I typed the sentence, the dog arrived, and I said, oh my god, there's a dog. <laughs> me up until that point that there was a dog. And, and you know, one of the things that I think some of us hesitate to talk about, because we don't want to make this sound mystical. I mean, at some level, this is hard work. I, I, look, it's not breaking rocks. I mean, hard work is being a pediatric oncology nurse. That's hard work. But at some level, you do have to keep pushing this rock uphill. But People ask you all the time about choices. I don't feel like there was any point at which I said, I will choose to name this character Mimi Miller. I feel like there was a morning when I said, when I was walking along and I thought, and then Mimi Miller does, and that was her name. And, and you know, somebody said to me, why did you choose to make Aunt Ruth an agoraphobe? Well, first of all, as I'm sure you may have noticed, that word is nowhere in this novel. There's some one moment where Mimi says, you know, there's a word for what Ruth has, and her mother sort of says to her, if you're going to start talking like that, it's going to go tough with us. It's going to go hard with us. Um, and the answer is, uh, I 
don't feel like there was any choice about it. I feel like at one point I started thinking about this, and all of a sudden it occurred to me that she had this aunt named Ruth, and that Ruth doesn't leave the house. So that the whole thing, if it's going correctly, takes on a kind of a life of its own. And once it has that life, the choices get narrower and narrower. I mean, you know, you can only, Miriam Miller is only going to act in certain ways, which is not to say that she's a static character, but you don't have an endless panoply of behaviors for her. She's a certain kind of woman with a certain kind of past who's going to face the future in a certain kind of way. And, um, and, and so your choices narrow the more you know about your characters. Um, and in some ways that's oddly liberating because it's what people mean when they say the characters guide the novel or the characters. I wish they guided it a whole lot more than I feel like they do on certain days. But there really is that kind of narrowing of your options based on, on situation and character, it seems to me. Who's got a mic? But we'll get we'll get to the back of the room at that mic. Um, just a question of your nonfiction writing. Which did you find easier? Um, you know, the great thing about nonfiction is you've got your notebook, so that you hit a snag and you just think, oh God, that great quote from the firefighter. You know, and you start paging through your notebook. Um, so. That helps, and the fact that basically I've been doing it my whole life. I mean, I, I, I wrote my first column between the time I was 28 and 30. Then I wrote another one between the time I was 32 and the time I was 35. Then I wrote another one between the time I was 37 and 42. And then another one when I was in my 50s. So if I, if I didn't know how to write a column on short notice and make it pretty coherent, there was a real serious problem there. I, I continue to find fiction more challenging, in part because it's a bigger canvas, um, in part because I try to make it different every time. Uh, I mean, I, I wrote many different kinds of columns about many different subjects. But that 800 word sort of ball in your hand at a certain level takes on a certain kind of form that you can mimic again and again and again. I, I can't do that with a novel if I'm continually pushing myself to try to do something that I've never, that I've never done before. When you were pregnant with your daughter, you wrote a column in the Times where you yes, and your, I did. <laughs> when your, you and your husband decided not to have amnio. Right. And I think the phrase you used, you both said, what did it, or I think he said was, wouldn't that be a waste of a good life or something like that? And I, it always stayed with me because I was pregnant at the time. And when I was reading the novel, I think I was surprised, even though Mimi is not you, but she decided to have an abortion. And what brought you to that decision that she would decide to have an abortion when, again, Mimi is not you, but when you had made that decision not to have an MBO, it just really resonated with me. Well, when, when Jerry and I made the decision that we weren't going to have amnio when I was pregnant with Maria, because no matter what the amnio showed, we were going to carry the pregnancy to term, I was a 36-year-old woman of considerable means. Mimi is a 19-year-old girl who's got squat. Yeah. Um, she's got her whole life in front of her, and like a lot of other girls I knew in the early 70s, she's having a lot of unprotected sex with somebody who would make a disastrous life partner, although at that point she doesn't really know quite how disastrous. So um, I, I think the juxtaposition is not between, you know, me at 36, but between her and LaRonda, because LaRonda, LaRonda, in some odd kind of way, plays by the rules. I mean, this is the way things go. This is the way things are. But also, she understands that she's got a safety net. 
Um, Mimi's got a whole nother set of rules and she's got a whole nother set of expectations. I mean, one of the reasons that, that she has that abortion, and she wants to have it, but one of the reasons she has it is because the disappointment she can imagine on the face of her mother would just be too much for her to bear. Um, and you know, you'll you'll notice that. Um, but doesn't she say that her mother knew that she was pregnant? Well, she but doesn't know. I mean, it's you know the great thing about the great thing about writing a first person novel, and the frustrating thing for the reader is I only know as much as Mimi knows. So Mimi doesn't know whether her mother knows or not, but. Does she think maybe her mother suspects? Maybe. Maybe her mother agrees? Maybe. You know, we don't we don't know what happened to Miriam in her past life. I thought you were raising the issue of the amnio column because it's the single most unpopular column I ever wrote. <laughs> the Times wound up having to run an entire page of reader letters wow. uh, from people yeah. who were enraged at that column. For those um, of us who don't know, what was it about? Oh, it was Why? a column about how we weren't going to have amnio because we were not going to, it wasn't going to change anything. And it was at a time when amnio still carried a not insignificant <laughs> risk of miscarriage to the fetus and had to be performed between four and a half and five months. So it was late in the pregnancy. And we, endless letters. I mean, I remember one that said, the Anna Quinlan I know would never have written this column. <laughs> I was stopping around the kitchen and I said to Jerry, the Anna Quinlan I know, she doesn't know me. And Jerry turned, whirled on me and said, you can't have invited all those people into our kitchen for three years and then deny them when they want a seat at the table. Wow. Wow. And it was kind of true. Um, you know, the part of the thing with the Life in the 30s column was that people felt like we knew one another. And, and I was saying to someone the other day, the most um, distressed letters I got were from people who had a sibling with a disability, oh. who said, your children will never know what it is to have your undivided attention if this goes wrong. And in fact, Maria was born and, and everything was fine. And then I got the letters from the people who had been expecting their third child at the same time and who had had the child with Down syndrome or spina bifida. And that was really painful. Yeah. Um, not for them, actually. Many of them wrote to me and said, I still think I made the right decision. I'm still with you on this. Um, but it was a, it was really kind of shocking because while I understood that there were many people who were going to disagree with my decision, my obstetrician disagreed with it. I, I, I did. I hadn't quite taken the temperature of how very very upset they were going to be. And and on the flip side, a number of people during the hardcover tour for Miller's Valley came up to me and said, I don't understand why you had put that one chapter in. And I'd say, which chapter was that? <laughs> you know, that chapter where she, which chapter? You know, I, I sort of wanted to push a little bit on it. And I just thought, well, for, for a woman of her age and her character at that moment in time, that seemed almost inevitable to me. <clears throat> Who's got the mic? Katie. Hey, Sal. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, we really enjoyed our discussion here, and one of the questions that came up was, why was the baby in the attic? Like, was there a reason for that? Wait, sort of. <laughs> As opposed to somewhere else? <laughs> But why the attic? <laughs> and, and what was the... Um, well, you know why the attic, because it was a hidden thing. I see. It was a hidden thing. I mean, it was, you know, it's where, it's, I mean, the attic's where you, the attic and the basement are where you hide things. Thanks. And in Miller's Valley, the basement isn't where you hide things because the basement floods all the time. So the attic is where you hide things. But, but if the question is like, 
What's the back story on that? Mm -hmm. The answer is, as I said before, I only know as much as Mimi knows. <laughs> and I think one of the important things about family that's encapsulated in that moment in the book is, Mimi could know more than she no, she she does she doesn't look at the newspaper that's in the trunk. Right. She doesn't ask any questions about it. She doesn't say to Ruth, "I looked in a suitcase that was in the attic." She doesn't do she doesn't do any of those things because she doesn't want to know. She doesn't want to know the answer because part of our family relationships is. You know, our, our families are to us what we need them to be. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, if, if the suspicions she has are correct, they make, they make her father, they make her mother, they make Ruth, they make them all different people than they were in her life. And you don't, you don't want your parents to be different people than than they were in your life. And of course, a lot of what this book is about is family and, and what we need family to be. Um, but, you know, I, I really, I, I, I'm not trying to be coy here. Um, I really think it's important that when you write a first person novel, you really have to be channeling that person. I mean, when I wrote Black and Blue, I was Fran Flynn. And the reason that that book was, and I know this is going to sound odd to anybody who's read it, but in some ways a pleasure to write is because I loved her so much. And I loved being her for that time that I was her. And, and it, it's the same thing with, with Miller's Valley. I mean, unless I was convincingly Mimi, um, the book doesn't work. That, in fact, that's where you tend to go a little wrong in a first-person novel. The particularly if you're somebody who for years wrote a first-person column, you have to really check yourself when the Anna voice tries to creep into the Mimi voice. And it, it, it doesn't happen for long. It tends to happen in maybe the first 50 pages. So you look over a paragraph and think, ah, 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 you know, and, and retool and, and pull back. But it, it, does, it does sometimes happen. I know you said you read four newspapers a day. Um, also, your schedule is very rigid. But do you get to read regular books? Oh, I, I are you kidding? <laughs> if I ever had a job where I couldn't read, I'd quit that job. I mean, <laughs> reading really is, except for my kids, like the grand passion of my life. I really feel like reading made me who I am in, in just about every way. And so, yeah, I, I read a lot. Um, I, I, I usually don't read um, during the day. I usually read in the evenings, but from about... 7.30 or 8 o'clock until about 10 o'clock, I'm almost always in this one chair I have with an ottoman um, reading whatever book I'm reading at any given time. Um, when I'm revising, I only read mystery novels because I, I tend, to, if I'm reading literary fiction, to pick up other people's ticks. And that's that's not good. Um, so, but But there are such great literary polished mystery writers writing today um, that that's not any kind of hardship. I just finished the new Denise Mina. Um, somebody on Facebook said you know, that they found it quite harsh, and in many ways it is, but it's also virtuoso performance by a wonderful, wonderful writer um, who also happens to have mysteries at the heart of, of what she does. So I'll be reading mysteries probably for the next month, month and a half or something like that. Um, and then I'll, you know, I'll go back and each summer I reread one of the big Dickens. Um, and this summer it's our mutual friend in the rotation. Um, and the rotation just goes around and around and that'll probably happen in, in August. But yeah, I read like a crazy person. <laughs> we have two people over here. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about the whole uh, place of water in the book, and like it just seemed like such a big metaphor for a lot of 
a, a lot of the sort of cleansing change, you know, the, the uh, washing away the old, the destruction. There was just a lot of different energy in it, you know. You know, I always wonder about metaphors, whether it's a chicken or an egg, because when I started thinking about this book, I thought a lot, I, from the very beginning, I knew that this was a community that was going to be threatened with flooding. I, it wasn't inspired by any place, although I've been told all over the country that it was in California, that it was in Illinois, that it was in Pennsylvania, that it was in upstate New York. But the, one of the stories that, that has always kind of intrigued me is the story of something called the Tox Island Dam on the Delaware River. In the early 1970s, the government was going to put a dam on the Delaware um, up where New Jersey segs into Pennsylvania. And there was an island there called Tox Island that had some people living in it. And, houses and they offered to buy them and then when they wouldn't buy them they used eminent domain and took them and everybody had to leave Tox Island and then they never built a dam and the, the houses just sort of sat there and I, I, it's always been a mental picture that stayed with me. Um, so when I thought about the, the water I thought about towns that become fungible. Um, and I also thought about the broader issue of an America that makes so much of its past fungible. I think this is the most American of my novels, and it's really about how we're a country that ritualistically wipes out the past over and over and over again and therefore forgets its lessons. I mean, it's not coincidental um, that some of this book takes place during the time of Watergate, um, and also that when Tommy Miller enlists, he winds up in Vietnam. Um, and then, as I was finishing it, I thought, but water is such a powerful metaphor for everything. It's a, you know, it's biblical. Um, it's used in so many great novels because it's, it's about life and to the extent that people drown or communities are wiped out by it, it's about death too. So I didn't go into it with the metaphor. I went into it with the water and then as you work on the book, the metaphor develops. And for me at least, that's the right way to go. Um, but as I was saying at the beginning of my remarks here tonight, one of the really fascinating things about writing a novel, because by the time you're done, you know, I'm so enmeshed in the lives of these people in this place. I have no sense of proportion at all. I don't know whether, I remember, I, I think the most telling moment along those lines was when I handed in black and blue and Kate was talking to me about the edits and she said, now at this part, I think if you did a little more of this, you would, you would increase the suspense here. And she looked up and looked at my face and then she said, you do understand that this book is suspenseful, don't you? <laughs> and the answer was no. I had no idea, first of all, because I knew what was coming, so I wasn't in suspense. Um, but second of all, because you become so engaged and enmeshed in the material that you lose that sense of proportion and, and that sense of of some of the underlying themes and issues that are driving you. And then you publish the book and a reader comes up to you and says, you know, it was so interesting how you made this stand for, you know, the place of religion in people's lives or something. About, and you think, yes. <laughs> And it's this wonderful, it's this wonderful moment when you're discovering something about your own work um, that you hadn't quite, you hadn't quite apprehended until that moment. No, no. Oh. Oh. Why Dickens? Why Dickens? because he's like a friggin' genius. <laughs> I, I think I'm on tape, I'm not. I didn't say that. Um, it's that combination of a social justice theme 
and a rip-roaring story. I mean, you never read Bleak House and think, oh, this man is trying to force feed me the fact that the legal system is endless and punishing. You're totally engaged in those characters. And then when you're done, you realize how they've been brooded about by the legal system. And, and the attention to detail is just, it's just extraordinary. I think, I think he's just an amazing writer. I mean, the fact that one, one of the most powerful images in all of, not of literature, but of reader response to literature is Dickens, of course, used to publish in serial form before the, the books came out, qua books. And so these, you know, these chunks of it would be published, and, and they would be published originally in London, and then they would be sent over to the United States to be published in similar chunks here. And Dickens was coming over for one of his tours because he was also a I won't even say an amateur actor, apparently he was quite a good actor who would pare down his own manuscripts to about an hour and a half to two hours on stage and then get up there and act them out. People, you know, people would practically storm the doors, but he was coming in on the boat and he was standing on the deck of the boat and people were mobbing the pier, shrieking, does little Nell live? <laughs> that effect, to have people who can't wait for you to tell them whether a character that you have utterly invented is still alive, when in fact, in a literal way, she never lived at all, but in a literary way, she's in, in some ways more real to them than real people they know. It's, it, it just brings home to you the incredible power of what happens in books and that incredible ability. You know, in Forster says in Howard's End, the most famous line in that book and in many 20th century books, only connect, only connect. And that's what fiction does for people. It connects them. It makes them feel less alone, and it makes them feel more like people they might be inclined to think they're different from. And that is so powerful at this moment in time. It really is. I mean, you know, for people to read The Kite Runner, for people to read The Bluest Eye, this, I mean, this is a moment where fiction matters more than any time almost that I can remember because of that. Only, only connect. Um, and at that, that moment with Dickens, I, it just, it just blows me away every time I think about it. I mean, there's, there's many, many other writers that I have powerful feelings about. I mean, I, I, I love all of Edith Wharton. Um, I love Faulkner. I don't understand why Hemingway and Fitzgerald get all the air. <laughs> Faulkner, is, yes. Faulkner is probably the most audacious novelist. Mm -hmm. I can think of. Um, there's a couple of novelists who've fallen out of fashion who never should have. Ford Maddox Ford, Theodore Dreiser. John Galsworthy's The Forsyth Saga is about as good three novels as you could ever want to read. He shouldn't have won the Nobel Prize for them. But don't get me started on Bob Dylan. <laughs> but, but they're really, really wonderful novels. And among modern novelists, um, Alice McDermott. I mean, Alice yes. McDermott. And she's such a wonderful human being, but boy, what a great novelist. Don DeLillo. I still think Jonathan Lethem's Motherless Brooklyn is one of the best contemporary novels. I've ever read. Um, there, there's just so much great work out there. And there's so much great work in the UK. We were talking before about the fact that one of the things that I like to talk to readers about, particularly if they're readers who are thinking of being writers but feel like the statute has run on them in some way in terms of where they are in their lives, is in England there's a very famous novelist who should be much more famous here named Mary Wesley, who's, I think there's maybe 10 novels.
novels. They're all wonderful. And she published her first novel when she was 71. And I couldn't love that more. It just, it, it just thrills me. I think it should give everyone hope. <laughs> well, do you want to do one more question? I think it's you. <laughs> I love the quote in your book when Mimi's in the um, barn and this is after her dad is sick and you say that cows are companionable animals to cry around. Dogs notice and they run over and try to lick her face and cheer you up. When there's no hope of cheering up, give me a couple of good cows every day. <laughs> My question, which is very simple, is do you have experience with cows? <laughs> um, well, I have sort of Secondhand experience with cows. Um, I, I I live in New York City, not far from here, but we also have a place out in out in the kind of semi-rural area of Pennsylvania, um, and there's actually a a, a farm. Uh, up the road from us um, that has lots of cows. Um, and most mornings when I go running by, I see them. Um, every once in a while, one gets out into the road. And it turns out I'm utterly powerless to get a cow back into, into a pasture. Um, but they have always seemed to me to have a, a useful combination of stolidity and stupidity. I mean, dogs know what's going on when you cry. Um, they always do. But cows just sort of stand there, and I, 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 I like the, I like the idea of that um, with her. So I, I just wanted to add a, a few more thoughts um, before we break. Um, we love book clubs um, in my neck of the woods. I mean, it, it's sort of axiomatic that no matter where I go, if I'm signing afterwards, a, a knot of women will come up together and say, we're in a book club together. We've been in a book club for 11 years. We're called the book hoes or something. <laughs> 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 talk about the books that they've read and what they've liked and what they haven't liked and so on and so forth. But I think the wonderful thing for those of us who write books is that book clubs make a book alive. I mean, a book is alive when it's alive in your mind, but in, at some level it's even more alive when you talk about it with other people. Because when we talk about books, we're not really talking about books. We're always talking about ourselves, um, and and um, that 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 sense, that sense of that connection, um, is really kind of thrilling um, for me, because I really do feel that books are are the most important part of a democratic society. I feel like um, where people read. Um, the big lies of demagoguery can't stand. Um, and conversely, I, I would say to everybody, um, beware the man who happily says he does not read. Thank you for helping us kick off our new program. This was perfect. Thank you so much.